Okay, so this video is a little bit different. It's less substantive than my usual video for one, but also depending on where in the political spectrum you fall on, you might have the urge to yell at me as you watch the video. That's fine. Maybe you watch until the end first, and if you still have an urge to yell at me after finishing the video, please let me know through Twitter. I'm open for discussion, as long as it's in good faith. Just, you know, be nice. I don't like getting yelled at. Oh, also, full disclosure, most of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the second half of this video comes from Nick Srinicek and Alex Williams' book Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism and a World Without Work. And it has been criticized by academics from the left, which you can find in the description. I will probably talk about them at some point in the future, but for now, let's just hear what they have to say. So with that in mind, let's get started. Let's do a thought experiment. So let's say the year is 2040, and the world is, well, it doesn't look good. CO2 emissions are down 20% since 2020, but that's not even close to the target of fixing climate change. Massive climate migration is happening, and developed nations are closing their borders. Income inequality is at its highest it has ever been and the number of unemployed people around the world are increasing rapidly due to automation. Everything is fucked, and everyone can see it clearly. Fearing a global revolution, the higher echelons of the world come up with an idea. The president of the whole wide world, or Mr. Worldwide for short. Mr. Worldwide is a democratically elected political position that can unilaterally decide laws around the world, and execute said laws with an iron fist. Say, for the sake of argument, anyone in the world can nominate themselves to run for Mr. Worldwide. Now, here's my question for you. If you want to be Mr. Worldwide, what would your main policy position be? Now, me, personally, I'd like to topple capitalism. Of course, that's way easier said than done. But hear me out here. I think there might be multiple ways we can do it through policies alone. How? Well, let me tell you about my proposals. Maximum income, advancing automation, and global UBI. Before we dive in though, you should check out my last video on neoliberalism, but if you don't have 30 minutes to kill, here's the important part for this video. A large proportion of wealth is controlled by the wealthy through the finance industry. They hold capital in the form of real estates, debts, bonds, and other financial instruments, and they essentially suck money from literally everything else through interest and debt payments. So if the economy grows, most of that growth goes to the very top. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so now we can jump in. If elected, I would implement a maximum income law at $100,000 in the US and the UK first. If you say, wow, that's really low, that's the point actually. I'm trying to crash the finance industry. And here's what I'll do as Mr. Worldwide next. First, maximum income will obliterate the real estate market because nobody will be able to afford both their mortgages and property taxes above a certain property value, essentially capping their prices. Real estate prices will then plunge, making it easier for my government to take over and decommodify real estate, while also disincentivizing landlords from grabbing more properties. Second, crashing the real estate market will also crash the financial market. Financial institutions, especially banks, will lose a sizable portion of their equity because mortgages will lose most of their value. Without equity, many private financial institutions will also plunge in valuations, and that's when my government, as the buyer of last resort, buys up all of the private financial institutions on the cheap. Third, with the full control of the financial sector, I will be able to assert power on transnational corporations. See, companies today use short-term bonds to make sure they have enough cash to function day to day. I can then, for example, force companies to let their workers unionize by only lending to corporations that allow their workers to unionize. Or you know what's even better? My government can lend only to co-ops, effectively killing non-co-op enterprises through illiquidity. Fourth, the financial crash will spread all over the globe. See, the profit from enterprises in developing countries actually flow back to the global north through financial institutions, what basically amounts to tax evasion. The amount of capital moving through the global north is quite staggering. I'm talking about trillions of dollars here. Some of those trillions of dollars are parked in real estate, which now will be worth much, much less. Fearing losing more money, the capitalists of the global south will try to move the rest of the money somewhere else, except that my government essentially controls the flow of capital now. So, I have leverage over them to actually start developing the global south, but you know, sustainably this time. Fifth, maximum income law will most definitely kneecaps world's economic growth, which sounds bad until you realize that a growing economy is not compatible with fixing climate change. So what we need to do is to distribute resources more equitably. As Mr. Worldwide, my government can do that through the establishment of worker co-ops all over the world, as mentioned earlier. And after the global finance market is under my control, I can start implementing maximum income law across the whole world. This money will be pooled across the globe and then be distributed through global UBI to stabilize aggregate demand. 
Sixth, with absolute control of the credit market, Mr. Worldwide will be able to start building green infrastructures all over the world without even thinking about profit or return on investment. I mean, we already have a solid blueprint on how we can mitigate climate change. What we need is a way to fund those projects without worrying about profit. The infrastructure development will be focused in South Asia and Africa first, then Southeast Asia and Central and Northern South America second, and then everyone else after that. This is done to serve the global market for more cheap labor to exploit, making it necessary to develop automation. Speaking of which, lastly, as Mr. Worldwide, I will prioritize developing automation even further as quickly as possible. The target will be global industrial production so effective that workers would only need to work as little as possible while also satisfying the need of everyone in the world. Or even better, most people would not need to work at all to satisfy the world's needs. Effective industrial production would also mean effective use of natural resources, creating a sustainable world where almost no one will need to work. Now at this point, the world will still be capitalist-esque in nature. But I think it'll be much easier to transform the world to a fully automated luxury gay communism this way. After all, if work and human worth is decoupled, what's the point of accumulating capital anymore? Of course, competition for status will most likely still exist, but it will be done outside of work, outside of capital accumulation, where people will compete by expressing themselves through other means. So why am I telling you all of this? Why am I LARPing as an authoritarian? Well, I really want the world to move beyond capitalism, and to do that, we need a set of policies that can get us there, though not necessarily these policies I just put forward. I have seen comrades on the left saying we need a revolution to move beyond capitalism, and only revolution will be able to do that. But I respectfully disagree. I think it's within the realm of possibility to end capitalism without a revolution. Now, am I saying we need an authoritarian political office like Mr. Worldwide in order to move beyond capitalism? Well, no. Mr. Worldwide is only a framing device I'm using to put forth some policies that I think might be able to help us move beyond capitalism. Am I saying we need these specific policies to accomplish that goal? Well, no. I believe there are many other sets of policies that we can use to do that. However, whatever those policies might look like, I argue they would need to accomplish a couple of things first before we can move beyond capitalism. First, it would need to empower workers so that they are able to work less hours for the same pay without reducing productivity, which would require, second, automation to advance. Third, economic growth would need to be capped at some point so that the world doesn't, you know, end. Fourth, because capping economic growth by itself would make the eradication of poverty extremely difficult, wealth would need to be radically redistributed throughout the world. Fifth, society would need to be much more energy efficient and environmentally sustainable. And lastly, all of these would need to be done globally, though not all at once. Let's talk about how this might look like in the future. As I already talked about in my video about AI and fascism, if we don't do anything, automation will likely leave a truly staggering number of people unemployable or, if they're lucky, underemployed with bullshit job and pay. But that doesn't have to be the case. See, the replacement of people by automation won't happen overnight. No, it will be gradual, job by job, and sector by sector. Factory workers at one part of the assembly line might find themselves replaced by machines one day. Then maybe a month, a quarter, or a year later, another group of workers at another part of the assembly line are replaced. And then before you know it, they have automation replacing even workers in the service sector. But what if we change that? What if, instead of being let go, those group of workers can just work less but keep the same pay? After all, the amount of work they need to do to produce the same amount of goods will decrease after the introduction of automation. So why not just work less? Obviously, the management wouldn't like that, but honestly, they can go fuck themselves. That's why unions will be important for the future of workers. Because collectively, workers will have enough leverage to demand less work for the same pay only if they're unified. More importantly though, these unions will need to transcend borders. Because capital is fluid and free-flowing, if the worker of one part of the world go on strike, capital can just shift production to another whose workers are more pliable. So global unity is really important. This also ties in to the capping of world's economic growth. See, we can't have an infinitely growing economy without an infinite number of planets, and last I check, we only have one. So at some point, we have to stop the world's economic growth, and part of that is keeping world's material consumption below a certain level. Coupled with increases in productivity through automation, this means much less work is required to provide for the world's needs. On the other side of this, though, is economic immobility. If the world's economy isn't allowed to grow, poor people won't be able to get out of poverty. That's why it's important to couple capping economic growth with a massive wealth redistribution, especially to the global south. 
There are many ways we can do this, from global basic income, to building green infrastructure projects all over the world, to wealth expropriation from the rich. And to be honest, I don't know which will work best, but it is absolutely necessary if we were to build an equitable future. Now, you might ask, what would a world without economic growth look like? Well, it would essentially be a world without consumerism. A world where social interactions are not mediated primarily through material goods. So for example, we would still have smartphones and computers and cars, well, maybe not cars, but there won't be new product iterations coming out every year. Goods wouldn't be used as a means to signify one's status within the society, so the production will be limited. What will be prioritized, though, are material needs required for a good life. Food, shelter, clean transportation, and so on and so on. Another important thing is energy efficiency and environmental sustainability. This entails replacing cars with public transportation system, raising the suburbs and creating dense, walkable urban areas, making air travel extremely costly, building nuclear power plants along with renewables, reforestation and afforestation, reducing food waste, utilizing permaculture and regenerative agriculture, replacing fossil fuels with clean energy, and like a gazillion other things. So if everything I've said up to this point is accomplished, labor would work much, much less, wealth would be massively redistributed, social interactions would not be mediated primarily through material things, and the world would be extremely energy efficient and sustainable. But it's still ostensibly a capitalist society. This is where I argue we should just accelerate automation to its endpoint, a world where basic material needs are satisfied without any human labor and thus are given freely to everyone on earth. With the social relations of production gone, there's no exploitation of labor anymore, making it easier to transform this world into a fully automated luxury gay communism. Now, if this all seem utopian to you, well, that's because it is. But we should be demanding a utopia, a better world, a world wholly unfucked by capitalism. What's more, a post-work socialism will fix a lot of problems in our world. Not all, but a lot. It provides the material needs for people of color, LGBTQ people, and women, freeing marginalized communities from the worst part of capitalism. Now, obviously, this wouldn't fix racism, sexism, homophobia, or transphobia within the culture itself, but I think it's something we all can rally behind. And this is not like some sort of sci-fi story of the past. What I've been describing in the past, I don't know, like 10 minutes, is completely possible. What we need to do is normalize the ideas, morals, ethics, and mores that serve as the foundation of post-work socialism. How do we do that? Well, this will take decades to do. So I think the most important part is to educate people on the material reality of the world, especially young people. We need to tell them that a better future is completely within our reach. Moreover, we need to erase this idea of there is no alternative that was espoused by neoliberal leaders like Thatcher and Reagan. We need to present realistic ideas and policies that prove that actually there are loads of alternatives. People just lack the imagination or are benefiting from the status quo. And we need to push this even further. It's not enough that we call out right-wing jagoffs anymore. We need to spread and normalize our ideas even more. And to do this, we would need to play neoliberal's game of social capital. Some people really abhor this idea, but I would argue we need to adopt their strategy if we were to accomplish anything. Neoliberalism is really good at stuff like building brand identity, enforcing mores, setting up standards, normalizing common sense, and so on and so on. Those are the stuff that we, as the left, need to hijack and repurpose to build our own hegemony to counter capitalism. Now, those among you who are, let's say, more radical than me, might want to yell, Goddamn liberal! at me. I get the impulse, I really do. And you know what? If this doesn't work, I will support your revolution. But I think we can agree on one thing. We need to spread leftist ideas to more people. Yes, this means debunking right-wing jagoffs, thurfs, sexists, racists, homophobes, monarchists, transphobes, white nationalists, nationalists in general, fundamentalists, ANCAPs, cathrads, neoliberals, and so on and so on. But we also need to tell people that, hey, the world looks bad right now, but here's an alternative that's good for everybody. An alternative that looks like a utopia, because it is, but it's completely within our reach. So join us. Together, we can build this better world. Hey, thank you for watching. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I talked about in this video, I uh, lifted it from Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism in a World Without Work by Nick Srichek, I think that's how you pronounce it, and Alex Williams. And I know there are a lot of um, criticism that people have, you know, brought up about the book. 
and about uh, post work in general. So I might go over them in the future and a lot of them are pretty valid, um, I think. Uh, but yeah, if you like this video, you know, do the usual stuff, like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter. And, um, you know, have a good day.